All we want as actors is to have great roles. <laughs> I have not had a career where all the great parts have come onto my desk. I just have not had the luxury of just sitting around and having people pour great scripts my way. I think of my career as challenging and working at it, making things happen. I'm Glenn Close, and this is the timeline of my career. Is, is it all right? It's not an it. It's a she. And she's all right. I was starring in Barnum on Broadway, and George Roy Hill and Marion Dougherty, who really, she pioneered the role of casting director. And George said later that she knew what he wanted more than he did. They sat and watched me in Barnum, and I was asked to come in and audition for Jenny Fields. But he can't feel life, so he takes off the gloves and he dies, but he finally feels life as he's flying into the arms of death. If that's what it means, I like it. And the memo that went out to all the agents was a young Catherine Hepburn. So I gave probably the worst audition of my life. I was not good at auditioning, but George told me later that it was probably the worst audition he'd ever seen because I was kind of trying to talk like Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> but somehow I got the role of Jenny Fields. When I got my first Oscar nomination, it was totally out of my even realm of possibility. I was in the cellar of Tidal Home where we were shooting The Big Chill. And I heard that I'd gotten nominated and it was like, what? It just was something I'd never dreamed of. I've never even thought of. She's got the hiccups. <laughs> you should be here. I feel like we should have had a chair for Alex. Of course you don't have enough food. <laughs> I was asked to do a reading by Larry Kasdan. I remember going up to Larry saying, I bet you want me to play Sarah Cooper because I wanted to play the part that Mary Kay Place ended up playing. I thought that was a much kind of juicier part. The entire cast got together on the lot of Columbia. I think it was a month before we went down to uh, Atlanta where we shot the epilogue, which does not appear in the movie. Uh, and we lived in these, we each had apartments out inland waterway or, you know, somewhere down in South Carolina. I'm an introvert, uh, and I would, you know, I was reading my book in my apartment and Mary Kay knocked on the door and said, Kevin and Jeff Goldblum and, and Joe Beth and I, we're, we're all going to meet and have dinner and play games. I said, oh God, I'm not, I'm sorry, I can't go. And she literally physically pulled me up pulled me in and that was the beginning of our hardcore group that ate dinner together, danced, played Trivial Pursuit, played jokes on each other, dressed up for Halloween. You know, that was the beginning of that. I love you all so much. I know that sounds gross, doesn't it? The life we learn with and the life we live with after that. With or without the records. The Natural came my way because of, of Robert Redford. I was cast in a Merchant Ivory film and it was my first real leading role part. Robert Redford, uh, I met him at his office in New York and he said, I want you in this movie and we can work it out uh, that you could do both. Well, it didn't work out that we did both and the other production got fed up and I lost that role, but I ended up playing Iris, which I'm very happy for because I love that movie. And I loved working with Bob Redford and that started a lifelong friendship. So what am I supposed to do? You won't answer my calls, you change your number. I mean, I'm not gonna be ignored, Dan. I never in a million years would call Alex Forrest a villain. And I've talked a lot about it because uh, people, Weren't, didn't know her backstory. They didn't know the why of her behavior. But after conferring with psychiatrists, I was playing a woman who had been incested by her father at a very, very early age and for long enough to really traumatize her. When you do the research, people who have gone through situations like that are incapable of kind of normal human relationships. 
there, it's like the Madonna whores. You're, you're made into a, into a sex object before you even know what sex is. Then you're made to feel shameful about it. You hate yourself. A sizable percentage of people, sadly, uh, can take their life by suicide. The original ending was that she actually did that. And I felt that that was how that character would end. But famously, they tested the movie and six months afterwards came back to me and said, we're changing the ending, which was was a real shock because I felt I was betraying the character that I believed in. Ended up doing it, not happily. What I learned from that is how important catharsis is uh, for the audience to feel like some sort of sense of order will be restored. I mean, and that's classic. It was a hard journey, it was a hard lesson to learn, but it's something I've never forgotten. I still think it would be fascinating to tell the, exactly the same story from her point of view. She would not end up a villain. You don't get it. You just, you don't get it. Well, I had no choice, did I? I'm a woman. Women are obliged to be far more skillful than men. You can ruin our reputation and our life with a few well-chosen words. I remember hearing that nobody's gonna go watch a costume drama. We proved them wrong. That was fun. I had just given birth to Annie seven weeks before I flew over to France. So I still had my mommy body that had to be absolutely crammed into a corset. And at the end of the day, I had these, these welts on my waist where the two kind of came together and rubbed. So, uh, and that's why I have those wonderfully full bosom because I had just weaned her. At first I thought, oh, maybe I could still nurse her during the filming, but to get out of those costumes and nurse and get back into the costumes would have, it would have been at least an hour and a half. James Atchison designed those magnificent costumes in Dangerous Liaisons. Stephen Frears, fantastic director. He did come closer and closer in on faces as the movie evolved, which to poor James Atchison would be pulling his hair because he wanted his costumes to show a lot. And I remember there's a scene of me sitting at my dressing table and he said, show the shoe, show the shoe. And I, so I'm sitting in kind of a weird position and you can see the shoe on my foot. <laughs> So of course I had to invent not only myself. Have you ever engaged in immoral conduct? What do you mean by immoral? It was defined by the Department of Defense, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, homosexuality, adultery, sexual acts with a minor. I'm a lesbian. You know, I'm always seduced by a story. It also was the first time, well, no, the second time actually, when I said, I wonder if this is gonna affect my career, whether people will have negative reactions if I play a lesbian. Whenever I've confronted with that question, my next question to myself is, well, what's the alternative? Not to do it because you're afraid? No. Why did you disclose your sexual orientation to the DIS agent? Because he asked and it was the truth. And I was being honest. Doing that movie at a time when it was uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, both Greta Kammermeyer and myself, we got these letters from women who said, I was thinking of killing myself. I can't tell you what it meant to see a hero that's like me. It had a profound effect on the LGBTQ world. And I'm very proud of that effect. And when Obama did away with the don't ask, don't tell, Greta was right there behind his desk. Anita, darling. Oh, good morning, Cruella. Well, I had grown up with a great Disney uh, animated features, uh, Snow White, Cinderella, Bambi. I was very aware of the value of witches in fairy tales. As a young child, I loved fairy tales. And to be asked to be a Disney witch, which is what Cruella is, um, was thrilling to me. So I, I had a wonderful vocal coach for uh, Cruella. And I loved the Joanna Lumley's accent in Absolutely Fabulous. And my coach, Joan Washington, uh, knows her and she had this very clipped way of talking. Also, I emulated Trevor Nunn who had directed me in Sunset Velour and he has this way of, t -t -t he, he makes things, um, take it or leave it, you know, and um, 
he doesn't talk like that all the time or else he'd kill me, but, but just really um, strong consonants and clipped very much in, in power. Alonzo, did you ask Anita if she'd like something to drink? College kids know me as Cruella because my costume collection is at Indiana University, which is fantastic. I was there at one point and we had a, a showing of, of, it was Fatal Attraction actually, but it's the first time they, these kids had seen that movie and they were, you know, just as stunned uh, as people had been all along. But they do know me as Cruella and the younger ones know me as Nova Prime in the Guardians of the Galaxy. So <laughs> my entire career is just those two, those two parts. What a charming dog. Thank you. Why don't you just leave the Roosevelt room the way the Roosevelts wanted it? <laughs> because Eleanor Roosevelt was too fond of chimps. God, I loved doing Mars Attacks. It was so much fun to be in the room with all those other incredible actors. Jack Nicholson for my husband. I had a Pat Nixon wig. That was pretty funny. And to be killed by the Nancy Reagan uh, chandelier. I mean, the whole thing was just delicious. But we had a, a perfect replica of the Oval Office. And um, whenever Jack Nicholson would come on stage, they'd play dun, 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 dun. So there was a great sense of fun, but also a great sense of professionalism. <laughs> Madam Vice President, this way we'll avoid the press. Is the president secure? Not yet. The recovery team will have him very soon. One thing I remember was um, they had a scene around that table where she broke down crying. And I said, I will not do that. I don't think that would happen. Not my vice president. My vice president would not break down into tears. She would step up to the, to the challenge. So they changed it. I love playing that part. Again, surrounded by a great ensemble of actors. I think I was kind of a late casting because I remember my hair was actually one of my pers my wigs that I'd used in something else and it was redone by my brilliant wig maker slash hairdresser at the time, Marcel Corneville, who just did me in, in Hillbilly Elgy. One of the great masters of the craft of wig making and all of Cruella's hairstyles, for example. He should have won an Oscar for that. I think directors are just showing off when they try to film a sex scene. I don't think they're really trying to show us sex. I think they're just trying to show us they're not afraid to show us sex. I mean, it's like they're all thumbing their noses at their mothers. Well, I had known Christopher Reeve since he and Robin, they were best friends. And when we were shooting my first movie, Garp, Christopher would fly in in his little plane, because he was a pilot, pick up Robin. They were bad boys at the time. And they would fly off somewhere for the weekend. They'd fly back. He would kind of dump Robin out. <laughs> I loved him. He would have been one of our top directors had he lived. He was astounding. It was a difficult piece. It was quite a literary piece. And he made it human. Uh, he made it actable. You know, the dialogue was, was wonderful. And to see him um, behind that monitor, in that chair, doing such wonderful work. I'm blessed that I experienced that. You know, I speak a little French, Mr. Coupe. And just because that little outburst wasn't in English doesn't mean it's not going to be on the record. What did he say? Tell me what, you, what, what did you say? He called me a manipulative bitch. You get that? I had done one season on The Shield. And it actually was John Landgraf who convinced me because he was all about the writing and the artists. He, he, and he still is that way. I mean, he's remarkable. So I did The Shield and that kind of was my first, you know, real toe in the water with, with series. So I said, basically at the end, if you ever, you know, have an idea for me, come, come to me as long as it's in New York, because that's where my life was at the time. They came back and uh, had one of the most brilliant pieces of writing I've ever read, which was the first pilot. I remember I gave it to my great friend, Ann Roth, who was designed costumes for me my, my whole career. And she also is a very smart woman with a great sense of story and everything. And I, and I asked her to read it and she, and she came back and said, you would be crazy not to do this. I did it and I signed my life away, you know, for po a possible six years, ended up doing it for five. The writers never, ever, ever let me down. The key to that character kind of came to me in a scene. It was a scene with Rose and I realized that her power came with keeping people off balance. The only time that she ever showed her true feelings was, was in private. Never would she let her power go by being emotional. 
uh, unless it was calculated. Please, may we go off the record? Certainly. He is slaughtering children, families. That is your business. Now I have other matters to attend to. Prick. I've always wanted to be in a superhero movie and I'd love to be in another one. I just love that whole thing. It's like going back to when I was, you know, six years old because half of it you have to act in your imagination. In the set, they had this big round thing that had this, uh, you know, you could see the hologram of the, of the battle, but of course it wasn't there. And they have some, some guy with a pole with a tennis ball on it that's like a spaceship. And, and I remember standing around there and thinking, yeah, I could do this. I used to do it when I was little. I can imagine that there's a war going on in front of me three feet away. <laughs> I, I love that stuff. Anybody out there? What's your name? Albert. Your real name? Albert. It took me 14 years to get that film shot. I got the rights to the material and, you know, uh, then I'd get a job, then I'd come back, then I'd, I had to, at one point, change directors. And when we finally ended up doing it, it was with the right people, the right cast. It was just the most wonderful experience because I've always been very attracted to characters who don't have any self-pity and yet they don't know that their dream is impossible, but we do, and it makes them incredibly compelling. I loved Albert for her innocent belief. Um, I played her as a woman who didn't know what she was. She had never been touched with love. She had never had a partner of any kind. She was existing as in disguise in order to survive. It's a story of someone who had to become invisible in order to survive. And I think there are so many people in the world who have had to face that. I don't want it. It's yours. It's all yours. It's have your fucking name on it. I can take it. I don't want it. I don't want it. We came to a point where I was told that Bjorn Runga was going to come to New York and we were going to have breakfast together. And it was up to me whether uh, he would be the director. During the course of that meal, I got a sense that he would be a wonderful man to work with. You know, you just, I had nothing to go on, except he's done theater, he's written, he's done movies. I said, at the, you know, I think, well, let's do this movie together. And he's one of the best directors I ever worked with, because he trusted the actor's face. He trusted the close-up. He used the close-up very judiciously to keep the audience emotionally connected to my character. You know, if a director sets up a feeling of trust, then you can, you're absolutely free you know, to do your best work. And we had that atmosphere of trust. And uh, with Jonathan, I mean, the first scene we shot was the scene in bed. <laughs> so, oh, hello, I'm Glenn, I'm Jonathan. Okay, let's jump into bed. <laughs> well, why can't we let her clean her own mess up for once? Cause family's the only thing that means a goddamn. I read the book basically when it came out and I loved it. And then I think it was a couple of years later, I heard that Ron had had gotten the uh, rights and was developing a script. I've always been very proactive about things. I wrote him a note. I wrote him a letter and we had done the paper, you know, a number of years ago. And I just wrote him, I said, whenever you, you know, are casting, I hope you will think of me thinking no one will ever cast me as Mamaw. And lo and behold, he offered it to me. We had time as a company to get together, to go to Middletown, Ohio, to meet the members of the family, of JD's family who were there, who had amazing courage to let these strangers come in, knowing that they were gonna portray themselves and members of their family. But we, each of us, each of us as individuals got time to talk to each member of the family. And we each had our own kind of questions to ask. And my questions were, how did she sit? How did she walk? What did she do with her hands? How did she hold her cigarette? Uh, what did her voice sound like? So you can do justice to, to who they were. There's nothing better than having a wonderful story and having a company that's like this great chemical creature, you know, that everybody's contribution count. And Ron Howard puts together those kinds of teams where you're free to do your best work because everyone is doing their best work.
what I've learned. You own your choices. You don't know at the moment why you are particularly attracted to that story, but you are. And you think it's good because you think it's good. Not because somebody tells you that you're going to make a lot of money or you're going to get an award. You think it's good. You have to stay subjective to your own spirit. You know, I've tried to do that. And at this point, you know, if I wasn't owning my career, I might as well do something else.